Kids at the high rise across the hallway from Ken and made his hamburgers for him. And I'm sure that means the world to you guys that uh, that she took time out of her day to come here. And so we don't necessarily remember people's words, but we remember their presence. And so thank you for being here today. Um, the reason we do these things um, is real simple, just a twofold uh, purpose of a memorial service. Of course, the first purpose is to remember the deceased, uh, but the second one is to comfort uh, those that remain. And so I think the greatest uh, comfort that we can find is going to come from the Word of God. And one of the most popular passages of Scripture during a time like this is Psalm 23. And so I want to read Psalm 23 to you, but I want you to notice something that I noticed um, a few years ago, and it really just stood out to me because this is so familiar that we don't even think about the words a lot. But there's something that happens right in the middle of Psalm 23 that, um, that happened during a time of death. And I, I want you to notice it. He says, listen to the way that he, that he refers to the Lord. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, referring to God, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So he's referring to God in this, I'm not good at English, but I think that's second person, uh, he pronoun here. But then he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So the death happens. And the way that he talks about God changes. He says, for thou art with me. Instead of this impersonal tense and referring to God as very personal, he says, for this death has brought me into this place where I'm thinking more about God. He says, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they come from me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So it's a comforting thought to think about how we can draw... Uh, our thoughts towards the Lord during a time of, of death, because we, we think about those things. We think about eternity. So with those thoughts in mind, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to come before you now and um, thank you that when we come to times like this to where um, it seems that uh, hope is gone because death has come, we're so thankful that there is still hope in Christ, that when a, a believer uh, loses a, a loved one that we don't have to say goodbye we can say I'll see you later and we're so thankful for the hope that we have for eternity through your son Jesus Christ and Lord we thank you for Ken's life and the many years that you gave to him and I thank you for his family and them being able to be here today uh, and I pray that the time that we share together would be uh, honoring to Ken that we would uh, honorably remember his life and at the same time, I pray that the, the family would be comforted today and that we would find that comfort through one another and through your word. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Ken uh, Sinus was born April 6 of 1928 in Pekin to George and Viola Goodwin Sinus. Uh, he married Mildred Luella Trainer on April 6, 1949 in Pekin. He later married Grace Larson on August 28, 1979 in Pekin. She died November 24, 1995 in Galesburg. He has also preceded in death by his parents one grandson, J Justin Sutton, two brothers, Al and George Sinus, and three sisters, Arlene, Tony, Viv uh, Vivano, uh, Helen, Hedden, and Phyllis Sinus. Surviving are two sons, Carrie and Teresa Sinus, Kevin and Amy Sinus, both of Pekin, two daughters, Rhonda Medina of Pe uh, Peoria, Vicki Sinus of Pekin, 11 grandchildren, 19 great-grandchildren, five great-great-grandchildren, and one brother, C. Edward Anna Sinus of Pekin. Kenneth was a 1946 graduate of Pekin Community High School. He carried mail for 17 years, and uh, then he started a career in the insurance business with Prairie Farmer in Illinois. He became the district manager and later took the position of state manager of Iowa with Wallace's Farmer. He finished his career as a self-employed independent broker until his retirement. He was a member of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Pekin and enjoyed fishing and working crossword puzzles. I'm sure those things are nothing new to you guys, but uh, it is, it's good to remember the, those special uh, memories and achievements and, uh, and family members uh, when we think about his lifetime. Uh, of course, I didn't know Ken, uh, but each of you did. And uh, one of the things that is always uh, precious during a time like this is when you get a chance to share those memories with one another. 
Um, I had a chance to talk with Carrie over the phone a couple of different times and just said, hey, tell me some stories, you know, tell me some things about your dad. And, and it seemed like almost every other time I've interviewed someone uh, after the death of a loved one, it, 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 this seems to happen every time. They, they say, well, let me think. And they have to think hard at first, but once they start sharing stories, more stories start coming and then more stories. And as a matter of fact, Carrie called me the next day and said, hey, I thought of another one. And he called and told me that one. And so that's why I always encourage families, you know, during times like this to, to share the those special memories because it's going to jog the memories of one another and it's always a, a special time and so uh, from what I've heard Ken seemed like the kind of guy that I, I think I would have liked to have been around he seemed like a very uh, outgoing uh, personality as a matter of fact that's exactly what Kerry said he uh, was very outgoing he said uh, he didn't know a stranger um, I think the phrase that you used, I wrote it down, was uh, he had an uncanny ability to bring people together. And early on, it was to play uh, baseball, I guess, uh, down where the Schnooks is now. Um, I guess there was a field or a school there at some point. And uh, it, Kerry said that he would organize these softball and wiffle ball games. He'd go all out. He'd get the clipboard. He'd name the captains and really just make a, a big deal about it. And um, Kerry said that he went to, uh, and the, the adjective that he used was this, unbelievable amount of Cub games uh, with Kerry and Kevin. And uh, he had a great love for the Cubs, as is evidenced by the, the sign out there, and I'm sure by you guys' memories uh, of him. Um, they had a lot of fun together at those games. Uh, Kerry said he had a way at the games. And so when you think of somebody that has a lot of personality and someone says they had a way at those games, then I think you guys probably know some of the things that he said and did. Gary said when the other team would hit a, a pop-up, he'd yell out, can of corn, you know, and not just yell it, but like loud. And the word that, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say anything out of line here. Gary's the one that said these things. He said loudly and embarrassingly, he would say those things. And then the big one that he said was give me a bingo, bango, bingo. You remember him saying those things? And I guess yelling it loud enough that it really got everyone's attention. So, um, like I said, he seems like the kind of guy that, uh, that most people would have enjoyed uh, to be around. As a matter of fact, I think Kerry said that uh, oftentimes he would strike up conversations with complete strangers and uh, just had a, a great ability to do that. Um, I mean, thinking about him being a Cub fan, I wrote this down before I saw the sign, but um, I can only imagine what it was like for him to get to see them actually win the World Series. You know, and I, I see the sign that says, Go Cubs, they're waiting in 2012. What year was it they won it? Was that 16? Yeah, so just a few years later they won it, and I'm sure there was a, a quite a party going on there for him. Um, that thought actually kind of segues into the second reason that we do memorial services. The first one is to remember the, the deceased, but the second one is to comfort those that remain. And that thought about him celebrating with his wife at the, 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 the World Series championship after 108 years um, got me thinking about a verse that's in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. It says this, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. Now, Ecclesiastes is a book that was written by Solomon, who the, which the Bible says he was the wisest man to ever live. And when I read that, I'm kind of questioning the wisdom of Solomon, because I don't know about you, but if I have a choice between going to the house of mourning, which is where we are right now, or the house of feasting, which is where he was in 2016, <laughs> after 108 years, I mean, do you want to go to a funeral? You want to go to a party? You know, so when, when Solomon says it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, it makes us question his, his wisdom there. But he explains himself in the rest of the verse. He says this, for that is the end of all men and the living will lay it to his heart. So, so the reason that he says it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting is because there's something about death that the, it makes the living, those of us that remain, it, it brings eternity to our hearts. It makes us think about uh, what comes after all of this. Because whether or not a person is a believer or not, death is a reality that all of us have to face. And as a, as a, as a Christian, I believe that the, the word of God is true and it talks about eternity and what happens after a person passes. And um, I think that many of us would have to admit that we probably have thought more about eternity over the last few days than we have over the last uh, few years. You know, because that's anytime a loved one passes, you start thinking about those kinds of things because Solomon was wise and he knew what he was talking about. He said the living really do lay it to their hearts. And so anytime I have an opportunity to, to speak at a, at a situation like this, I always like to ask people if they're ready for eternity. 
Because the truth is all of us are going to be in one of those caskets one of these days. And it's important that we're prepared for that. Um, my responsibility as a pastor is to comfort those that remain. And oftentimes it's really hard to comfort people whenever a person passes. Because death is a, a terrible thing. Um, when a loved one passes, it, it hurts. My, my children, just last night I got home and one of our four cats was dead by the, uh, the entrance into our home. And our kids haven't really experienced death yet. And I watched my 17 year old daughter just broke her heart. And I'm thinking, it's just a cat, you know, like, come on. But it's so final, it's so permanent, you know, and as meaningless as a, an animal's life may be in light of a human's life. I mean, just think, I actually told my daughter that last night, you know, you think this is hard to think about the families that have lost a loved one recently. Death is difficult. And the, the thing about death is, in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't God's plan. Like when God created the earth, his plan was not for death to happen. As a matter of fact, when he created, it was Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and they walked with God and talked with God. And I mean, not like in prayer, but like they physically and visually looked at and talked to God audibly. But of course, you probably know the story. The serpent came along and tempted Eve to eat off of the tree that she wasn't supposed to eat off of, and that's when sin entered in. And that's when God separated himself from man because God is a holy God and sin can't be around in his presence. And so um, that was not God's plan for man to sin and be separated from God. God wanted to have a relationship with us. That's why he created us so that we can be in a relationship with him, not just on earth, but for eternity in heaven. And of course, Adam and Eve, their sin led to their children being sinners, which led to our children being sinners, led to us being sinners. You know, I used to tell people, you don't have to teach your kids to lie. You guys ever notice that? Like you don't sit your kids down and say, let me teach you how to steal out of that cookie jar without your mom knowing, <laughs> you know, most dads, there may be some out there that do that, but most kids, you don't have to teach them. They're naturally born sinners because of Adam and Eve. Death was not a part of God's plan, but the good news is that he knew that it was going to happen all along and God had a plan. As a matter of fact, there's a little verse in Genesis three that, that didn't make sense to me for a long time, but it talks about how when Adam and Eve sinned, God said, he's, he's bruised your heel, but I'm going to crush the serpent's head. And at the time I first read that, I thought, what does that mean? What is, how does that make sense? You know, well, what ended up happening, of course, the seed of Adam, their children, all the way down to finally when Jesus was born and Jesus being the son of God, you know, he left heaven, lived here for 33 and a half years, didn't sin one time. And when he died on the cross, that's where the Bible says he crushed the serpent's head crushed death and gave us an opportunity to be able to uh, be saved. As a matter of fact, Jesus was not a sinner and he died on the cross for us. You've heard that, right? Jesus died for you. The reason he died for us is because we deserved it. It's kind of like when I was driving over here, if I were to get pulled over speeding, which I never do, but had I been uh, speeding and they gave me a ticket, I know Carrie would say, I will pay that ticket for you, right? No. But uh, what that means is I'm the one that's guilty, but he wants to pay the price for me. And that's what Jesus did. We're the ones that guilty, but we're guilty, but he died for us. And here's where the disconnect is. A lot of people think, well, yeah, Jesus died. And so I got to be a good person. You know, I got to be as good as I can so that when I get to heaven, you know, the good things I do outweigh the bad things that I've done and I'll make it in. Well, the problem with that is the Bible says there's none good. No, not one. None of us can earn heaven on our own. It's only by the grace of Jesus Christ. He was the only sinless one. He gave his life on the cross and three days later, he rose from the dead. And the Bible says that forgiveness comes when we believe the gospel. Gospel is just a Christian word for the fact that Jesus was the son of God that died for us, was buried and rose again. I remember as a, an eight year old boy, I was listening to the preacher preach a message about sin and hell and all that, you know, hellfire and damnation stuff. And I had heard it before but there was something that clicked in my head that day. Like I realized like I'm a sinner. I deserve punishment for my sin. And it was like conviction, you know, like I knew I was in the wrong, but I was glad that the pastor didn't stop with the hellfire and damnation stuff. He talked about Jesus and how Jesus loved me, even though I was a sinner and he loves me today and wanted to save me. And so on that day, I put my faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, which brings me to the last story that Carrie shared with me. Of course, Carrie believed the gospel. Uh, later, how old were you when you believed the gospel? 38 years old, it's a little bit later in life. And uh, he wanted to make sure that his dad had 
believe the gospel had had a chance. And so he uh, called his friend uh, that he was going to church with, and he asked his his friend. This was 22 years ago, about that, somewhere around 22 years ago or so. Uh, so Carrie and uh, his friend from church went over to uh, Ken's house, and uh, the, his friend had a, a, a New Testament. You know, the Bible has an Old Testament and a New Testament. This is a New Testament here. His friend had a New Testament called, uh, the, and it was called a Share Jesus Without Fear New Testament because it shared some of the verses that I've talked about just a moment ago uh, with you and just kind of helps you tell people about the gospel and heaven and those sorts of things. And Carrie's friend opened up the Bible and just shared the same story that I just shared with you. You know, that Jesus loved us even though we were sinners, died for us and rose again. And it was on that day that Ken believed the gospel and Ken prayed and asked Jesus Christ to be his savior. And I love what Carrie said. Carrie said, I have no question in my mind that my dad trusted Christ 22 years ago. And because of that, because of his testimony of faith in Jesus, not because Ken was a good guy. To be honest with you, I don't know if he was a good guy or not. He sounds like he was a fun guy, but let's be honest, none of us are good. You know, if Ken is in heaven today, it's not because he was good. It's because he put his faith in Jesus Christ. And according to the testimony of Carrie, it sounds like that's what he's done. And so I'm glad I can give you the hope that we can be reunited with Ken someday because of his faith in Jesus. Here's where I didn't know that I actually had a small tie uh, with Ken in my life. Because after seeing his friend lead his dad to the Lord with that share Jesus without fear New Testament, Carrie started giving a copy of these share Jesus with no fear New Testaments to every person that went on their missions trips uh, to Grenada. And in 2014, I went on one of those trips with Carrie. And in 2014, almost seven years ago, Carrie gave me this Bible, which is a share Jesus without fear New Testament. And so I'd like to think I have a, a small tie with Carrie that I can take a, a Bible that is very, the same Bible that, uh, ever, the same type of Bible that was there on that day. And so my prayer is that if you don't, if you can't remember a time where you've believed the gospel and put your faith in Jesus Christ as your savior, my prayer is that you would respond to the gospel like Ken did 22 years ago. I'm not asking anybody to be a Baptist or to sign up to go to church every day or anything like that. Because remember, it's not about what we do. It's about what Jesus did on the cross. And I hope that, um, that each of us have that testimony. Kerry told me that he got to see his dad just before he passed away, just a few hours before he passed away that night on New Year's Eve, right? Um, and the phrase Kerry used to describe him was this. He said he was resting very peacefully. And I'm happy to report that right now, Ken is still resting very peacefully because of Jesus Christ. And I believe that's the most comforting thing that I can share with you is that him resting peacefully did not change when he drew his last breath because he was at peace with Christ. Not because he was a good person, but because his faith was in Jesus. My big question to you today is, are you at peace with Christ? Let's pray together. Our Father, we are so thankful that uh, during a time of, of, of hurting, uh, a time of, uh, of, of mourning a, a loved one, uh, I'm so thankful that we can still have hope because of you. And um, as we think about Ken and his life and so many good memories, I know each person could go around the room right now and share some special memories that they have. And I, I pray that it'd be an opportunity for them to share some of those with one another in the days ahead. But Lord, as we, as we do what Solomon did, as we lay it to heart, as we think about these things of, of eternity, I pray that you'd help us to have our hope uh, squarely upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ, knowing that our only hope is in him. As we continue to keep our heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment, as, as we just meditate on, on Ken's life and, and meditate on our own eternity, um, I just want to ask you that simple question, you know, are you at peace with Christ? Has there been a time where you've believed the gospel? If there hasn't been, I want to invite you to believe the gospel today. To what the Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord. It's, it's not a magical thing. It's not you know something where you're going to get chill bumps and anything like that. It's just a simple, God, I know I'm a sinner, but I'm thankful that Jesus loved me while I was a sinner. So much that he gave his life on the cross for me and rose from the dead three days later. I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. I believe the gospel. It's as simple as that. And if you've never done that before, I want to invite you to take time to do that. And when we're done, 
uh, here. If, if you have any questions about that, I want to try to answer any, or you can look me up and reach out to me later on if you're more comfortable with that. Um, if you are saved today, then I just want to say what I said at the very beginning, you know, that ultimately a, a Christian doesn't have to say goodbye. You know, so when we walk by and see dad's face, grandpa's face, brother's face for the last time here on this earth because of Jesus that doesn't have to be the last time we don't have to say goodbye we can say I'll see you later let's pray together again Lord we want to thank you for Ken thank you for his life thank you for the uh, the family members that you've given to him so many uh, grandchildren and great grandchildren and great great grandchildren uh, thank you for the people that invested in him and to think about those that that helped him uh, in his last years here on this earth as he was uh, struggling with uh, some other health issues. And I just uh, thank you for the support that he had. Thank you for his family. And I pray that you would comfort them during this time. I pray that um, as much as eternity is on their mind during this time, I pray that it would lead them each to you in their walk with you. And I pray that uh, you would bring them hope uh, that only you can bring and that you would give them comfort that only you can give. And I pray that as we all mourn a little bit differently, may all of our mourning eventually lead us to you and our faith in you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. In just a moment, I believe uh, the ushers are going to be coming in. I don't know if you noticed it or not at the beginning, but they were playing. Um, I think that was uh, in the garden there at the beginning. And I think we're going to finish with the old rugged cross. So those were a couple of songs that Ken had picked to have at the service. And so uh, they'll be playing that as the ushers dismiss us here in just a moment. <laughs>